Okay, so this question I think is an interesting one. I know some of you have done it already, but it's going to give us an opportunity to explore some more ideas of mechanics, okay? If you've done it already, that's not a problem. That's great to see. We're going to try and think about what's happening. It says a lift of mass 500 kilograms is lowered or raised by means of a metal cable attached to its top. Shh. The lift contains passengers whose total mass is 300 kilograms. The lift starts from rest and accelerates at a constant rate, reaching a speed of three meters per second after moving a distance of five meters. Find the acceleration of the lift. So I'm actually gonna start off for part A and recognizing that they, they haven't told me the acceleration. So there's no point in doing F equals MA because I don't have the acceleration. But they have told me a few things. They've told me that it starts from rest. It reaches a speed of three meters per second after it moves a distance of five meters. So they've told me a few things. They've told me it starts from zero, it gets up to three, and it moves a distance of five, and we've been asked to find out what the acceleration is, okay? What connects those together? What, what, v squared equals u squared plus two a s. So we get 3 squared equals 0 squared plus 2 times a times 5. So you get 9 equals 10a. So the acceleration is 0 0.9. Most people got that part already. OK, that was the SUVAT part. Now's the part where I've realized we haven't done much force diagram. So it's good for me to point out some of these things here. We're going to try and find out the tension in the cable if it's moving down and if it's moving up. So we need a diagram to think about what's going on here. And a few people started off by drawing the lift, and they only had a force going downwards, which I was saying to the girls would be rather worrying, because if you're in a force that's only got, if you're in a, a lift that's only got weight, there's no force in the other direction, you will literally <coughs> just be falling straight to the ground, like dropping something to the ground. And that's not a safe lift, because everyone dies. So, there's obviously going to be a force that is resisting that motion. Now, if you imagine what it feels like to be a giant lift, you feel the weight of the metal lift and the people inside it, but you also feel, coming out the top of the lift, the force that's stopping it plummeting to the ground. You feel the tension. And the clue about it being tension is, first of all, it's asking about the tension in the question. And the second thing is it's talking about a metal cable. When we talk about a metal cable, we're talking about like a metal string, really, OK? Um, so that's the T part that we've got there. Now, instead of thinking of this lift as like a lift and then lots of people inside the lift with all different weights, the better way of thinking about this is to imagine that the lift and the passengers is just one big block. And that one big block has got a mass of 800 kilograms, which means that the weight, the force, is 800 G. And there are a few people getting confused about when do you put G in, what does G mean? The weight of it is the mass times, the mass times G, and G is just 9.8 here. Now, we have been asked to find out the tension in the cable if the lift is moving down. Well, if it's moving down, we've just worked out that the acceleration is 0.9. So we're going to say it is accelerating downwards with 0 0.9. Now, the tension in the cable, the, ten the cable is the thing that does the moving. Okay, It uses the weight to help making something move. Now, imagine that this red thing that I've got in my lanyard is the tension. This is the lift with all the passengers in. If I want to make something move down, I still have to hold it. I can't just like let go, otherwise it would drop to the floor. I would just lower it down. Okay. What can you say about how I'm having to lower it down, the tension that's in this string, when I lower it down versus when I raise it up? Which one do you think would be bigger, the tension in it when I'm letting it go down or when I'm having to raise it up? It would have to be when I'm raising it up, because when I'm raising it up, I'm having to work against the weight of the passengers in the lift. When I'm letting it go down, I'm actually trying to just stop the weight of the passengers dropping to the ground. OK? Huh? That happens. If that happens, it's over. It's, it's game over for everyone. So we're expecting in this one, when the acceleration of, is it's moving down, we are expecting the down tension to be smaller 
than the app tension. And we're going to just see what happens, OK? So now we've got this diagram drawn. We're going to do resolving. Which direction is the one we should be doing, up or down? Down, because the acceleration is down. So when we resolve downwards and we use F equals MA, we've got that the force is 800 G. And we're going to subtract the tension. And that is equal to the mass times by the acceleration, which is 0 0.9. When I solve this equation, by adding t to this side and then subtracting 800 times 0 0.9. In fact, let's just do an extra stage. 800g is, what's 800g? Get my calculator, I've put it somewhere else. Here it is. How much did you say? 7840 is 800g. So we'll actually just go straight in. So 7840 minus t equals 720. So when you solve that equation, you get that the tension is 7,120 newtons. So it's still pretty big. There's still got to be tension in there. And the reason there's got to be tension in there is because if there wasn't, they're falling. Now we're going to look at the second scenario, which is if the lift is moving up. So it's almost going to be the same apart from the direction changes. We've still got the weight. The weight can't change. We're not throwing anyone out of the lift. And there's still going to be tension but it's obviously going to be a different tension because we're trying to make the thing move up. And you just told me when I was layering, uh, lowering and raising my keys to pull it up is harder work than to let it go down. So I can't be the same value of the tension here. This time, though, I'm going to, raise it, I'm going to resolve it upwards using F equals MA. So what's going to be different? What's my first resultant force going to look like? Hassan, what's my resultant force going to look like if I'm going upwards this time? Good. It's going to be T minus 800, careful, just T minus 800G, because it's the weight, not the, not the mass, OK? And it's equal to the mass times the acceleration. So 800G, we worked out before, is 7840. And this is equal to 720. So look at what's different about this line and this line. What's the difference? It's just the other way around, OK? So they're the other way around because of the different direction that we resolved in. So in this case, when we rearranged it, we did 7840 minus 720. We're now going to do 7840 plus 720. So we're going to get that bigger answer, which is what we were expecting. So t is equal to 7840 plus 720, which is 8560 newtons, which is as we expected. To make it move upwards, the force that's doing the pulling upwards is going to have to be bigger. And it has to be big enough to overcome the weight and then to make it accelerate that we've got there. Okay, So it's not an easy question because we're having to do quite a few things at the same time. We were having to think about uh, drawing forces. We were having to do SUVA. We were having to find resultant forces. And there's also some quite complicated ideas that we have in there as well. I'm going to have a look at maybe just one more example, and I'm not going to go on to the next bit that I was thinking about doing today. We'll do that after the half term instead. Um, we're going to look at one more thing that was just on the next example on this, and then I'm going to ask you to do these questions for homework. And I'm also going to tell you about some other things you can have a look at over the next week as well. OK? Um, so this question is also in the, in the booklet. And it is from an old exam question that has been abridged, which actually means some of the information at the beginning may not be relevant. OK, so there's some of this information at the beginning is not relevant. So don't worry about that. You can see I've gone straight to part C. That's because part A and part B have done some different things on a different topic. But basically, we have got a particle being projected vertically upwards from a point A with speed U. The point A is 17.5 metres above horizontal ground. This is all irrelevant, just because I know where the question goes. The particle P moves freely under gravity until it reaches the ground with speed 27 meter, 28 metres per second. So I'm just going to tell you, we don't need this for this question. We would have used it for part A and part B. But all we're being told now is there a particle, and it's moving towards the ground, and it's hitting the ground at 28 metres. Okay. The ground is soft, and after P reaches the ground, P sinks vertically downwards into the ground before coming to rest. The mass of P is 4 kilograms, 
and the ground is assumed to exert a constant resistive force of magnitude 5,000 newtons on P. So this is a weird kind of question that's happening here, right? We're going to try and find the vertical distance that it sinks into the ground before coming to rest. There's so many kinds of bits of information that they've given us that it's like, how do we even get to finding the vertical distance? How do we get into anything with distance? Have we got any ideas of the two things that might be coming up in this question? What are the two kinds of areas of mechanics that could be coming up? Pardon? Suvat's going to be in there because we're asking about distance. They seem to be telling us about coming to rest, and we know about the speed that it hits it. So we've definitely got something to do with Suvat. And the other thing is what we've been doing today, the forces side of stuff. Okay? So let's just have a think for a second. And this is maybe not how I would draw the diagram, but it hits the ground, and then it's going to sink into the ground a little bit of a distance. So it's going to have moved all the way down in that direction. Now, when I draw it, it's going to be quite difficult to draw the ground. But really, once it sinks into the ground like this, that's it kind of sinking into the ground. There's a few forces that would be acting. Now, I want you to imagine that you're this ball that's falling into the soft ground on the Earth. Tell me one of the forces that you have as the ball. The what, sorry? Gravity. The gravity, your weight. You feel your weight as that particle. And they've told you here that the mass is four kilograms, so your weight is 4g. And what else did they tell us? There's another force that you would feel as you were going into the Earth. You feel a resistant force by the Earth. You feel the ground slowing you down. And there's a really big force of 5,000 newtons slowing this ball down, right? And which direction is it moving in? Downwards. So I'm still going to say it's moving downwards. It's got an acceleration downwards because that's the direction it's moving in. And if I work out this, if I do F equals MA here, it's hopefully going to give me a value of A. And then I'm probably going to be able to do SUVAT. So let's have a look and think. Um, right, if I'm going to resolve and I'm going to use downwards as the direction because that's the direction of the acceleration, and I'm going to use F equals MA. I just want you all to think to yourself, because I'm going to ask somebody about this, what is the resultant force for this one? Don't tell me, just have a think to yourself, and I'm going to ask someone, what is the resultant force in the downwards direction? Locke, what do you think the, the downwards force is as the resultant downward force? Good. It would be 4G minus 5,000. And then the right-hand side, well, I'll stick with you. Look, what's the mass times the acceleration? What's the mass? Four. four. Good. It's 4 rather than 4G because we're asking mass rather than weight. And the acceleration is the thing that I don't know that I want to try and find out. It's going to be negative, OK? You can tell it's going to be negative because G <laughs> is basically 10, right? So you've got 40 minus 5,000. You've got a really, really negative resultant force here. So let's just work that out. We've got 4g, which is 4 times 9.8 minus 5,000. And I'm going to divide that by 4. So I get that the acceleration is 4g minus 5,000 divided by 4. And you get minus 1,240.2 meters per second squared. Because what does minus acceleration, what does negative acceleration mean? Deceleration. Deceleration. Good. So as this thing enters the Earth, it's slowing down. And that's exactly what would happen if you saw this happen. When something goes into the ground, although it happens incredibly quickly, it has speed and it's being slowed down. It is being decelerated by these forces that are happening here. And it's going to be like one of the questions. I think question 11 in the homework I'm going to give you is about something that is slowing down. So you should expect there to be a negative acceleration, because that means deceleration. Okay, So this is a deceleration, which is exactly what we were expecting for it to be, because it's falling into the Earth and slowing down. We want to find the vertical distance. We want to find the distance that it moves into the ground before coming to rest. Okay. 
So that's the bit that I think Red One said, we're going to now do SUVAT because we've got the acceleration, which is the bridge that takes you between SUVAT and forces, and we're now going to be able to work this out. So some of the values I know about is that the acceleration is minus 1,240.2. What else do I know? What is U? Good. U is the, sp the initial speed of this journey. U is 28. And it looks like we're taking downwards as the positive direction here, doesn't it? Because we're saying when it hits the ground, it had a speed of 28. When it's gone all the way in, it's got no speed at all. We'd say that the velocity at that stage is zero when it's finished. I know it's finished moving because it says when it comes to rest. So that must tell me that V is equal to zero. I've got three numbers. I want to find the fourth number. The fourth number I want is S. So I'm going to try and find out what S is. And I know that V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. So 0 equals 28 squared plus 2 times minus 1,240.2 multiplied by S. So just a bit of rearranging that we've got here. So you get 2,480.4 S, just multiplying that and putting it to the other side, equals 28 squared, which is 784. So S is 784 divided by 2,480.4, which is 0 0.316 meters to three significant figures. 0 0.316 meters. How, well, I guess we'd probably, it might be, might be sensible to think of that in centimeters, which is 31.6 centimeters. Does that seem like a reasonable answer? It does seem like a reasonable answer that something has fallen into the ground and it has moved about 30 centimeters into the ground because it does say that the ground is soft and it was moving pretty fast when it hit the ground at 28. So I like to show you this example because, again, it exaggerates the idea of how do we draw forces. But the interesting thing was that we had a negative value for the acceleration because it was slowing down. It still had this idea of doing SUVAT, though, and connecting these things together. So you can have things that are slowing down and have a negative value for that that will come up. OK? You're going to do that whole exercise, basically, uh, for homework. And I'll just tell you about some other things that I wanted to speak to you about as well.